Hey guys, today um, is a quick video where I'm going to talk a little bit about guitar strings and guitar maintenance um, and also kind of give you guys a little bit of a walkthrough of um, my guitar collection, uh, which should be a bit of fun. I get a lot of questions about guitar strings, about maintenance, about um, all these sorts of things. So I figured I'd create a video and actually answer some of these things up front for you guys. Um, and help you and I'm going to actually take you guys through a walkthrough of restringing my PRS um, Because it's due for one um, today, and it's actually really good timing for this so stay tuned and enjoy the video Okay guys, so now we're gonna actually change the strings on the guitar We're just gonna do a quick change for me today. So I don't want to go through every string It's just gonna be a crazy video for me to shoot and kind of edit together um, but what I'm going to show you is basically how we change one string on the guitar. Now, there are different types of string changes. If you, you can remove the whole set of the strings um, and then give your guitar a proper clean down and everything, you've just got to be mindful of your bridge, right? So if you have a floating bridge, um, the bridges are naturally under tension, okay? So what it means is that if there's no strings on it, the bridge can go down and backwards and the block um, which you can actually see on the back there. It's that here, the yellow part inside um, can actually then go on an angle and hit the body of the guitar, which isn't good for the guitar or for the bridge itself. Okay, so you've just got to be careful and make those sorts of decisions. If you want a quick string um, change, maybe just go one at a time because then you're not going to have that issue of the block kind of going down and hitting the rest of the guitar. Um, some other types of bridges. Let's have a quick look because they all make a difference. Um, my ML, so this guitar, and then my Jackson Rhodes, and then my Ibanez Xiphos have guitar uh, bridges that look a bit like this. So this is a Floyd Rose. Uh, I think this one's licensed. I think in my Jackson 24, it's a proper Floyd Rose. Um, these are like real kind of crazy 80s bridges, um, and they get all sorts of weird and funny sounds out of the guitar, which you might have seen me do on the Jimmy Barnes joke cover video for Screaming Cowboy um, and you'll hear Dimebag Daryl and players like that do a lot of that sort of stuff and it's really the only way to achieve it with a bridge like this. Now saying that there are a lot more work um, to kind of get in tune because you've actually got to go into the back of the guitar and you've got to work on the strings, uh, sorry the springs and get the correct tension between the bridge and the back and then the strings on the front okay so that the bridge actually sits parallel in here okay that one's looking pretty good um, now when you change string gauge on a bridge like this it's going to throw all of that balance and tension out the window so you've got to actually adjust it and find the right spot and it's a very very temperamental process which is why a lot of people don't like these sorts of bridges then we've got some um, other bridges like this a couple of my guitars have string through bridges it's a bit of dust on this guitar so i apologize um, but this one's pretty simple to set up um, and so like Gibraltar style bridges as well so some Les Pauls and stuff they pretty much just have a, um, a little bridge saddle here that you put the strings into um, and I'll show you kind of the different parts of the strings and how they fit right in that um, in the next part um, but I just want you guys to have an idea sort of at some of the different types of bridges that are out there as well because they will affect how you set up your guitar. Okay guys, so let's actually get into um, the first steps of restringing your guitar. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna actually get rid of a string and loosen it. Now, whether you change the whole string set, the process is the same, or whether you do one at a time, then obviously do one at a time. But the first step, if I just move the camera here, is you want to, if you've got locking tuners, which I do, you wanna remove the locking tuner um, on the Floyd Rose bridges, they look a bit like this on the nut. So that's a locking um, nut there. So you want to take that off so that obviously you can move the string and get rid of it. So that's step one. Step two is then you want to loosen the string. So you can hear it going down in pitch, which is awesome. So just change the angle again here. Right, so now my string's starting to get floppy which is good, okay? It means it's ready to start to come off, okay? Now, some people will just take a set of pliers um, to their string from here. Once it starts to get loose, you can see it here moving around a bit now. I don't like to do that, it just feels a bit weird. 
um, and I don't like any kind of sudden movements or snaps on the guitar, <laughs> really, just in general. Um, cool. So then what we want to do is once I've got things loose enough, we then want to remove the string. So unwrap it from the tuning peg and then actually take it out because it'll be passed through a hole in the tuning peg, pretty much on every guitar. Um, they've all got that feature. Okay, so the string is off, great. Then what we want to do is we want to pass it through the body and out of the bridge. Okay, so on this guitar, the string will actually come out the back, which I'll show you. So you can see it hanging out there. So then we wanna get rid of it, okay? Just make sure that you don't scratch your guitar on the way through when doing this, so be careful. Um, or you might actually wanna cut the ends because they'll be a bit tangled um, as you're doing this, okay? So I'm gonna try and feed this one through so I get it, hopefully without any scratches. You don't wanna see me cry on video, it's not pretty. Cool, all right, so that's good. So now I've got the bottom string off, okay? Now what I'll generally do is give the fretboard a bit of a polish and a clean. Um, in this case, I'm only doing a quick change today, so I'm not gonna do that. Now, then grab your strings. So I'm gonna open up my set of Super Slinkies, um, courtesy of the boys at Ernie Ball. Thank you, fellas. Shout out to Rick and Damo as well. Um, all right, so I'm gonna grab the bottom string. So this will be the thickest string in the package. So. Usually most of them will tell you what the gauge is on there. So remember uh, nine to 42, so this is 42. So this is the bottom string, the thickest one. Okay, very important. Don't mix your gauge up when you're restringing. Okay, when we open up the string, this is what they look like. They come wound and you've got two ends. So you've got um, the end that's got the little ball, a brass ball, um, can be a different material sometimes. Um, and then you have just basically the end of the string, the pointy end, okay? So what you want to do is you want to take the pointy end of the string and you want to feed it back through the back of the bridge for the bottom string slot. Okay, so let me try and get that here on camera. Cool. All right, and it's coming through the front. All right, so then what you do is you pull it up and through. And what will happen, as happens on a lot of guitars, is that then the ball will actually catch in the bridge. They're kind of designed that way so that they just sit there. Okay. Now on a Floyd Rose, you're actually gonna have to cut the ball off and you're gonna have to insert the string in into the saddle, okay? They're a little bit different in design. I'll show you guys. So here's the Floyd Rose. So this is the saddle. There's a, uh, a screw here. So you undo this with an Allen key. That creates a bit of room. And then the string actually, like once you cut the ball off, you've got another pointy end, you chuck it in there. You tighten up the saddle again, and it actually just sits snugly in there, okay? So that's that step. Then what you guys do is you want to bring the string up. Very importantly, you wanna sit it through the correct position on the nut, okay? So the nut is here, and there's a little slot here for the sixth string, so make sure you get the right one. I've made a couple of mistakes at times with that and I feel pretty silly when I get to the end of a string change when I've done that. So I'm gonna pop that through and sit it into the nut there. Cool, you can see that. Then we're gonna wrap it around the tuning peg. So I tend to, it depends on the type of headstock that you've got, but I tend to go under. Um, and then on these ones, I'm going over down the bottom just because of the orientation. But just take note on your guitar with how it's set up, whether they're under or over, and you wanna try and replicate it because if you've got a new guitar, chances are it's been set up by a professional who knows what they're doing, okay? Now, the um, it's a little bit can, um, contended, I guess if that's the right word, in terms of like how many times you wrap around. Some people do it heaps, some people don't do many. I'm kind of in between, so I might do like maybe two wrap arounds, the tuning peg, so I'll go one and two. So what we we're talking about was we want to place the string through the nut, then we want to wrap it around the tuning peg, okay? And like I said, it's contentious with like how many times you do that. But today we're gonna to go, I think that's one and a half to two is what I usually do, especially on thick strings, okay? You gotta be careful not to run out of room. So then what you do is you pass it through the hole on the tuning peg, which you'll see there, so you can see the string, and then you want to feed it through and wrap it around, okay? Now, so that will leave the guitar string like this, really loose. You can see it's in place on the nut. 
you can see it's in place on the bridge. Um, then what we've got to do is tighten it up. So you start to tune the peg upwards, okay? And then you'll feel a bit of tension come into the strings. All right, so we keep going up and it's gonna to start to snap and pop at times as it, the string falls in place, right? And it'll go through a bit of a cycle of going up and down, okay? Which is perfectly normal. So you can see there, it's getting tighter. It's getting tighter. Awesome. Cool, and that's sounding almost in pitch. There it is. So it's now an E. Now what's gonna happen when I move the string here, is it's gonna snap out of tune a little bit, okay? So th some things that you can do to help with tension is pull around the bridge a little bit, just to kind of let the string settle around the saddle. And then you can also, I will usually bend kind of the excess string in the same direction that I've wrapped around, just so it's nice and neat, okay? So you can see it's dropped out of tune again, which is normal. Cool, cool, and then it's back up, okay? So that's how to do a quick string change, guys. So you wanna repeat that process for every string. It's a pretty uh, tedious task. It's not my favorite part about being a guitar player, that's for sure. Now, then what you wanna do is obviously remove kind of the excess string. Um, so I just will kind of give it maybe a centimeter or two away from the bridge, and I'll actually snip it there, just so it's nice and neat and there's, you know, not excess string that's gonna fly around and poke, poke me in the eye or anything, okay? So that's how to do a quick string change, guys. So I hope that answers a bunch of your questions. Uh, if you've got any other questions, feel free to comment them below. And if there's any other ideas for videos you wanna do, um, then hit me up, leave me a uh, message or a comment, and I'm more than happy to kind of consider them and put them together if they're great ideas. Um, make sure you subscribe to my channel as well, okay? Cheers, guys. All right guys, so if I told you that I didn't have many guitars, I'd be lying. Let's have a look at some of them. All right, so down here, I have a couple of my treasures. So I have my PRS. This is my main recording guitar and teaching guitar. Um, so this thing is absolutely stunning with tone um, and playability and it's the most versatile instrument and you can tell that a just dude with a big fat beard has sweated over this thing because it sounds amazing and it plays absolutely um, incredibly. On pretty much everything that I throw it at, so whether that's like kind of like soft, clean, blues, even jazzy type stuff, which isn't really my forte, or it's like super hard metal, um, this thing can handle it, it can handle shred, it can do pretty much everything. Uh, down here, this is my Dean ML, Dime Slime. Um, so I love this guitar. This was actually a bit of a goal guitar for me for a long time, and it took me a while to actually find one. Um, Dimebag Daryl is my guitar hero. I absolutely love the dude. Um, and he has brought me so much joy. Um, and yeah, don't get me started, right? Like on Dime, because I absolutely love that guy and his playing. So this guitar, more than anything, was actually more to kind of honor him. Um, it's not a USA model. I would love a USA kind of a Dimebag style guitar but probably a 90s Washburn at some point. Um, but they're getting harder and harder to find. So that's my uh, beautiful Dean ML, and I just have so much fun on that guitar. Down here, I've got a really rare guitar, actually. This is an Ibanez VBT700, nicknamed the V-Blade. Um, this thing is super rare, and they only released, it's between 600 and 1,000 of these worldwide before they got sued uh, for making them. Um, now, I'm not gonna go into kind of the lawsuit thing, but yeah, guitar making world can be a bit funny and a bit uh, sort of bitchy um, at times, I hear. <laughs> so that kind of went down uh, with that one, but I managed to snap one up and I've only really seen a couple in Australia. Most um, of them end up in the hands of thrash metal players um, and me being a thrash metal player kind of um, was attracted to that sort of guitar. All right, let's have a bit of a look at my rack here. Um, so this guitar, let me grab this one out. Is an Ibanez XPT700, nicknamed the Xyphos. This thing's an absolute beast. So this is actually, it's not quite a uh, signature model, um, but the dude from Necrophagist, uh, so Mohammed Seismes, incredible guitarist actually 
came up with the design for these. Um, pretty cool guitar. I've not really in love with it as much as I used to be anymore. I don't really dig the pickups as much as I used to, just now that I've developed myself as a producer and an engineer, they're not really my thing. Um, but this guitar absolutely shreds. Um, the other thing too is that it's it's heavy, right? This is a solid mahogany body with a neck through. Don't ask about that screw there. It's um, a mistake that kind of happened in an old band setting one time on tour. We won't go there because it's painful. Um, but this thing is also really weirdly balanced because it's so heavy. So I'm gonna put this one down. So it's actually making my arm sore. All right, the next guitar we're gonna grab here is my Jackson RR24. I love this guitar. It's so freaking Spartan and bare bones. So single pickup, bridge, single volume knob. It is just no nonsense shred machine. 24 frets, neck through. Look at that joinery. Um, and you can pretty much access anything on this thing. And the neck is super, super quick. Um, and I just, yeah, the first time I played one of these, I fell in love with them. They're just a machine. This is the guitar that I took to Japan and toured with in my death metal days. And there's actually a really funny story um, behind that guitar. When I got to Japan, um, I obviously put that in um, kind of oversized baggage. And when I got off the plane, you know, obviously I'm concerned about my guitar. So I rushed down to the luggage carousel and I'm looking for my guitar, looking for my guitar everywhere, kind of freaking out a little bit. Like, you know, um, this it could be broken, it could be stolen. I've heard all sorts of things on tour. And then um, I see it actually like on this little island in the middle of the uh, luggage carousel where you can't actually access it, right? So someone had put it up there and stored it, which was awesome. And then um, I go to a security guard or I guess one of the airport dudes like, hey, that's my guitar couldn't speak a word of Japanese. He looks at me and he goes, oh, like, you know, he understood. So he actually like jumps over the luggage carousel to the island, grabs the guitar, um, it's in its case. And then he literally gets down on one knee and hands it to me like a sword. It was like the coolest moment ever in my kind of guitar playing journey. And that guitar is kind of like a sword. <laughs> Back is my beautiful old Ibanez SZ uh, 520 QM. I love this guitar. Um, so this was like my first real guitar, okay? And it was a present uh, from my mum and my dad when I did really well at school. So I got ducks uh, one year and then dad took me down to the guitar shop and said, pick a guitar. And this was it. And yeah, this guitar and I have been through a lot um, because I've had this since uh, I was in year nine. So I was 15. So I've had it over 17 years now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, look at that, right? So neck through, it's mahogany body. It's really thick mahogany body, so kind of like a Les Paul. I put some hot rotted pickups in there. Uh, they're some deactivators, I think, but they're super, super um, kind of touchy and hot, and I love the tone out of this thing. It's just, um, yeah, it's a punishing guitar. All right, my left arm's getting sore holding these guitars up for you guys. So this next one is my Cole Clark Angel. Um, so... I pretty much went into this guitar store in Richmond, in Melbourne here, and I tried every acoustic in the shop because I wanted to buy my first like high-end acoustic. And um, this was the winner clearly over any other guitar in there. This one just sounded the best and it is a gorgeous guitar. Um, it's starting to age a little bit. Like I've had some issues with the bridge cracking and I had to take it into the goals at, uh, guys at Cole Clark, but they were really good about fixing it. Um, and they're amazing local company. The other ones I've got, um, this is kind of like a, a beaten up old SZ. So this is like almost stock, but I've changed out some of the cosmetic stuff, it's more as a, a project guitar. But this guitar came up really cheap on a local kind of um, guitar trading site. So I snapped it up because it's cool and I love it. And it's actually a really good looking guitar. Oh, and then I have my trusty Yamaha bass. So I've had this thing for so long. It actually came from a friend back in high school who um, literally traded me this guitar for a tank of fuel <laughs> in his old Falcon, um, which is a, a kind of Aussie iconic car. It's nothing special, but it's done the job. I used to play in orchestras with this thing um, and all sorts of bands as a bassist and I still record with it. So that's a bit of a run through of my guitar collection, guys. I don't have many, do I? Liar. Um, and I always want more. <laughs> that's the thing, it's never gonna stop. I love guitars, I love collecting them. Um, yeah, and I love adding to kind of what I got and learning about guitars all the time. I want a Fender Strat one day, right? I'd love a really nice Gibson Les Paul, a high-end one. I want a USA Washburn. 
Um, I'd love an eight string, um, and there's a bunch of other guitars I'd like to collect and acquire over the years, but probably gonna need more space for that.